All right, is everyone here for the Linux container internals? Okay, if you're not here, we're gonna fly to Boston, so you're stuck on this airplane. Ah, all right. So, this presentation has the wrong names on it. I realize that. These are my partners in crime from Red Hat Summit a while back, but uh, this is a lab that we've run before. So, we're running it again here, um, and we'll run this again at uh, Red Hat Summit, actually, in May or June or whatever that is. But, um, so, how many of you guys understand and have played with Docker? Good, all right, that's good, because this class should go deep. <laughs> um, how many of you understand and have played with Kubernetes? Good, that's more than most of the time that I've done this, so. <laughs> um, crap, all right. I feel like this thing keeps making noise. All right, so, so the way this, how many of you have laptops? Okay, good, because you, to go along with the labs, you'll have to have a laptop. Um, and, how, and is everyone able to connect to the Wi-Fi? Is there anybody that doesn't have Wi-Fi access? Okay, so that's good. If you didn't raise your hand, then I'm assuming you know what you're doing and how to connect to Wi-Fi. Um, we're gonna do like, we're gonna attempt to do three of these four labs. These labs are available online, so even depending on how far we get, I mean, you can complete them yourselves afterwards, but I'm going to go through the presentations and present some stuff live. We don't, so, so we don't have any more? Yeah, we're out. You don't need them though. You don't actually, it's not critical. So some of you got lab guides. I was hoping to give them to everyone that came, but we didn't have enough. I didn't know how many people were, I, I had no idea that we were going to actually move to a bigger room and then have more people. So we got moved to this room and now there's more. But it's not critical that you have it. The one, the, the people that do have it, You'll have stickers for putting these in your, in your lab guide, um, and then you can take them home. But, but honestly, I mean, all the drawings and stuff are available online, so you don't need them. And I'll show you how to get to this presentation, and how. To, and in fact, you'll even be able to watch a recorded version of it, if you want, um, with with a system that we're going to use called Catacoda. Um, so, so not to worry, you will be okay. You know, it's it's not critical that you have the lab guide. So, we're going to go through probably. I'm guessing. My guess says we're going to end up getting through three of these labs instead of four because we only have an hour and a half. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to do a small presentation and then go into labs. And then we're going to walk around and help anybody that has problems. But you shouldn't have problems. It's a, it's, a, it's a dedicated environment that has virtual machines that are configured in a very specific way so nothing should break. And um, the tool is actually really cool and really easy to use, and so you can click through. If any of you, how many of you have done tutorials on Kubernetes.io or the Kubernetes docs? So it's the same system that they use. It's called Catacoda. And so it's very cool. It's like this interactive environment where you can like read some text, click on something, it types it in, and it's a, it brings up a terminal, and you can actually type commands on it. It's a, like a pre-configured virtual machine. So before I kind of jump into the presentation, are there any, is there anything I missed? Any questions before I jump in? Say that one more time. Yeah, the lab guide is available online. I, I'll give you guys all the links too. Um, and also, I guess the easiest way is probably, um, here, I will just bring this up. Not that I'm trying to get more Twitter followers, but if you, if you want, um, if you want me, if you want to follow me, I will post all the links here. I have no idea why this is doing this. Um, phone number, <laughs> yeah, everyone has my phone number now. If you recorded that, but uh, all right, come on. My 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 name is Father Linux. So so if you want to follow me on Twitter, I will post all the links here, and. Uh, Everything that we're gonna do here is available online. So the lab guide, you will not be able to get stickers online. You can make your own stickers if you want, but, but uh, I will not be sending people stickers. <laughs> They're expensive, so. Um, but I will have the lab guide and then the Catacoda environment. So I'll, I'll just show it to you real quick. Um, the, the Catacoda environment looks like this. So, um, so it's under my profile, at Father Linux, but um, you'll see here, it's like catacoda.com slash Father Linux, and then 
it's under the intra open shift. There's these four labs that we're going to be going through the, the, the one, two, three, and four. So these are the lab guides for the container internals. Or these are the, these are the actual interactive labs that we're going to go through today. Um, does that answer your question? Hopefully, I think. OK, cool. Any other questions? Oh, the, oh, you want to see it bigger? Yeah. Uh, how do we do that? But it will only enlarge, it won't enlarge the URL. I'll do this. Um, let's do this. I got an idea. How about that? All right, so we'll add them in here as we go. So, uh, so actually, here, we'll do this. So anybody that needs to type these things in. All right, so, so uh, um, hopefully that helps. And then we'll, as, we, as we figure out things that maybe aren't documented that well, I will. Oh, yeah, OK, that didn't work. There we go. All right. So if, if we don't have any other questions, I'm going to jump into presenting. Any other questions? OK. So I want to try to get through at least three of these. So um, oh, actually, here. Well, so these are probably not right, actually. So I will send out the right ones afterwards. Um, and these are older. So I'm going to jump right into the actual presentation. So um, we start with architecture. In this lab, um, kind of an overview and resetting what you understand and know about containers. And then we move into like a single host tool chain. So like what a single container host looks like. And then we'll move into a multi-host environment, what a multi-host environment looks like. And then we'll move into a distributed systems environment where you're actually troubleshooting things like you would do in production. And so it's kind of a progressive setup where we kind of reset what you know, understand really the way container internals work, the way containers get created and how, the, how to troubleshoot them. And the idea is that this should help you really be able to build better container images and really run containers in a better way. Then we'll move into the host tool chain so that you kind of get a feel of the lay of the land of what a, the tool chain looks like, because it's actually a lot more complex than people think. I think you run a single command in Docker, and you think it's easy. And then when you go to architect your own environment, you have to learn a lot more stuff than you think you do. Um, and, and honestly, a lot of it is just bridging some gaps. So that's kind of the whole. The whole idea of this presentation is really to, to bridge some gaps. So first and foremost, and you'll see this again in, in, uh, in the lab as you go through it, but the internet is wrong. So if you look at all of these architectural drawings, they almost all show like a blue line. This is not in color, but there will be a blue line that says Docker. And it shows containers running on top of Docker. And it's incorrect. Like containers do not run on Docker. Docker is a daemon. It's an API daemon that accepts requests from a user. It then translates those requests into, actually it talks to a bunch of other daemons, which we'll get into deeper. Um, and then eventually this comes out to be a system call called clone instead of fork or exec that creates another process on the Linux system. And so most people kind of think, they either see one of two things. They see the blue line and they go, oh, well, if I just run Docker, Docker then my Docker containers will just run because they run on Docker, but they do not. And then the other drawing that you'll always see is like sometimes you'll see that Docker runs on you know, a Linux system and that the containers run, but you will never see the other processes running side by side. So you will not see other user space daemons running side by side. You will not see regular processes running side by side and containerized processes. They're really all equal. They're all just user space processes. So there's two main ways that this is basically wrong, all of these drawings. And they all lead to the conclusion that I can just run Docker and, and that's where the containers run. They run on Docker. They do not. Docker is essentially a daemon that makes it really easy to run containers, but it's not actually what runs the containers. So at the end of the day, containers are really Linux processes. They're not, you know, they're really two things. They're Linux files when they're not running, because when you pull them down and export them, they're nothing more than tar files. And when they're running, they're nothing more than processes that just happen to be, as I always say, fancy. They're just fancy processes that have a little bit more isolation, and they are sandboxed in a way that that they look, they have the illusion or the, the, 
you know, extra isolation to where they look as if they are running on their own system, but they're not. And so at the end of the day, they're really, you know, what, what you usually interact with is user space libraries to create these containers. So all definitions of a container that we have now, LXC, LXD, um, Docker, Rocket, these are, you know, Cryo. So we have Cryo. I don't know how many of you know about Cryo, but it's a, a, a runtime that works in Kubernetes. All of these have their own definition for what a container is. And so, for example, if you're running Docker and Rocket and you do a process list in Docker and a process list in Rocket, they will not show you each other's containers because those are user space definitions that each of them hold and they keep track of. But at the end of the day, they're using like Lego blocks in the kernel to create a container. And so a container is this word that we use, but it's not really a thing. It's, it's defined at a higher level. And so you either have a Docker container running, or a Cryo container running, or, or a Run C container running, or a Run V container running, which actually is a VM, et cetera, et cetera. So it's important to understand that like, basically all of these libraries are kind of, so, so this drawing is really important to understand. The user comes in, they talk to, they either create a, you know, normally you would type a command on the, on the shell, and a process gets created, right? It could, could be created with C groups or SE Linux, or maybe not. It depends on whether you have those things enabled. Um, but with a containerized process, you typically come in and you go through one of these libraries. You either use LXC or systemd nspawn or libcontainer or libvert. And this is if you're a programmer, right? Maybe you would do some cryptic, you would like program some code that would actually talk to one of these libraries that would create a container. And then the typical, typical technologies that would be used are something along the lines of namespaces, C groups, and SE Linux. And C groups and SE Linux, have been used for a long time. What really changed with Docker was an easy way to access the namespaces, so using the clone system call instead of a fork or an exec. And so in a normal shell, when you type a command and you hit enter, it either execs into another thing or it forks into another you know, process. And so does everyone understand like basic Unix internals of fork and exec? So if you need more, I will, I will answer any questions. So. Now, now, like going a little bit um, deeper into what most people have probably, you know, been exposed to is when Docker four and a half years ago got famous, it made it really easy to create a container. And so then we all started to internalize this concept of, oh, I just use a container. Um, but really, like this is what it really is. So I don't have my glasses on, but, but uh, uh, what did I do with my glasses? Oh, there they are. All right, so. So like, if you, importantly, I don't have a laser pointer, but, but if, if you look at this box, the big box, you know, you'll see it's Docker D, Container D, and Run C. So really, it's three different processes that are firing off to actually create a container. And Docker D is a daemon, Container D is a daemon that runs, and then Run C is actually just a process that gets created that actually creates the container. Run C is what actually talks to the kernel, does the clone syscall, which then creates the namespaces, and Run C also is smart enough to go create the C groups and, 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 and SC Linux. Actually, depending on how things are configured, libsc Linux creates you know, a new context and et cetera, et cetera. So there's, Run C is actually responsible for that communication between the kernel, you know, between the user space and the kernel. But there are actually two other demons at work. And so like, most people don't understand that this is what's happening behind the scenes. And really, all of these things are running in user space. And you'll see Container D, actually, not yet. This is actually a future as of the last I checked, a future architecture. The logic for pulling container images is actually embedded in Docker D right now, but will be moving to Container D if it hasn't already. Um, and then run, you know, run C is just, all it does is it takes a config file, config.json, and a, and a directory. And you literally pass it a file and a directory, and it fires up a container. And whatever's in that config file, which the, re the runtime, Docker D and Container D basically create entries in that config file, or, or in the case of Cryo, it's the same thing. It uses a config.json, and then makes run C basically just gets called with this config.json in a directory, and it creates a container. Um, but I don't think a lot of people, I think there's probably a very small percentage of people that have real good clarity of how that works. And so then, you building upon this even further, um, you know, in this one, I still kept the Docker D. This is what a typical Kubernetes environment looks like, right? So, so now we've added some more user space daemons. We've added the node, which is responsible for going and talking to Docker D. And we've added a master, which is responsible for talking to the node. And it, for effect, I've added systemd to show you. Well, systemd actually starts, you know, the Docker daemon, OpenShift node, the OpenShift master, and Etsy D. And so those are the four things that you configure on a system to actually start. And that's kind of the entire tool chain. You know, that's what, 
That's what a fully configured Kubernetes environment looks like, or an OpenShift environment in this case, which is just a distribution of Kubernetes. Um, that's what it looks like in its full glory. Um, and then again, it starts containerized processes, and then there are other regular processes running on the system. And then the containerized processes use these you know, technology in the kernel, but these ones don't necessarily. And again, container D goes and pulls the image, or cryo. I, I have a drawing where I kind of show cryo replaces Docker D and container D, and imagine that as one box, and cryo goes and pulls. It uses its own library to go pull images and then expand them onto disk. Um, but that's kind of its full glory. Does that make sense to everyone? Any questions about that? Because that's actually. Uh, no, Container D, so in the latest releases of Docker, for sure it has Container D, but they're moving functionality between Docker D and Container D. So Docker D is becoming more just the API endpoint, and then Container D is doing the logic of pulling the, pulling the container images down, expanding them onto disk, and then creating that directory that Run C needs to then go create a container. Say that one more time. That's correct. Uh, run C is basically lib container nowadays. So it is basically lib container. Um, yeah, and the other problem with this, a lot of confusion, is, is that this has changed very quickly over time. And so four and a half years, this has changed immensely. The original architecture was Docker just did everything. Docker D did everything. And we slowly broke them out into different pieces. So like libcontainer was the first iteration. It actually, used, I believe, that if I remember correctly, it just used libLXC the first, at first. It didn't even have libcontainer. So it actually used an existing technology to go, create, to go talk to the kernel to create those containers. Then they broke out the logic and kind of made their own ones because they wanted flexibility. And I don't remember all the architectural reasons why. Um, created libcontainer. Then at some point, the world changed and we wanted to create what was called the OCI, where we wanted to have a standard runtime for all, a standard way that we pull images and a standard way that we explode those onto disk, and then a standard way that we run those. And so like, I have some other drawings, I won't go deep into them, but, but that's what drove the creation of Run C. So, we, so Docker Inc. separated off Run C as its own thing, contributed it to the op Open Containers Initiative, and now Run C is kind of that middleman. It knows how to take that explode, that config.json on disk and the directory, and then turn it into a Linux process in a, in a very specific and particular way that's governed by that OCI standard. And so that's important because all the runtimes are basically using that now. So Cryo uses Run C and Docker uses Run C, and um, I don't know if Rocket uses Run C. I haven't, I haven't kept close to it. I, I believe it does or can, anyway. Um, so does that make sense? Any other questions? All right, so all right, so now I want to kind of show you, this is what a full, you know, this is more of a, here's how it would look in production, right? So you would have multiple masters. So here's how, here's, here's I'm going to walk through this. So this is how a user would come in and create a container, right? In a Kubernetes environment, it's multi-node, so you wouldn't just come directly to a node and create a container. You would come to the API, right? And in an OpenShift environment, the way our installer works is it creates an HA proxy that actually will load balance between multiple masters. Those multiple masters keep track of all the different nodes with etcd, and actually etcd keeps track of everything in the Kubernetes environment, and a node just happens to be another object inside of Kubernetes. And then each node looks like this. So each node would have its own Docker D, its own container D, its own instances of run C running. There would be multiple ones for each, for each uh, containerized process. And then some of the nodes would run a registry server, you know, uh, maybe one or maybe multiple ones, it depends. And in this scenario, this is an old drawing. I used NFS. Um, the new ones use Gluster. Um, I think out of the box it uses Gluster now. And, uh, and, but, but either way, it's the same concept. At the end of the day, the backing storage for the registry in OpenShift and whether you, whether you use OpenShift, which kind of is opinionated about how to create all this stuff and has an installer that shows you, even with regular Kubernetes, this is the stuff that you would have to set up yourself to really create a production environment. You would have to set up your own. Basically, Kubernetes gives you sort of this, this, and this, you know, but like it doesn't necessarily give you that and that. So like, and it doesn't necessarily give you a way to add and delete nodes and like, like some niceties, basically. And then also, OpenShift does things slightly differently, which we'll get into in deeper. Like, like any Linux distribution, Kubernetes is you know, kind of like Linux in a lot of ways, that there are a lot of different distributions of Kubernetes. And so like where you put config files and you know, things like that can be different between distributions. And so Red Hat's OpenShift is kind of similar. 
And then finally, I just want to walk through, like, I think this is another point of confusion people don't understand. I tried to do this kind of super drawing of, like, what is OpenShift versus, you know, what is governed by the CNCF and then the OCI, which is actually part of the CNC, uh, part of, you know, all these are part of the Linux Foundation. But, but you'll see, you know, Containerd, Fluentd, Kubernetes, and the Technical Oversight Committee, which is a group of people that's not a piece of software, are all part of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, right? And so they help kind of govern and manage you know, these projects. And there are a lot of technical people that are involved in this TOC, some from Red Hat, some from Docker, from CoreOS, from, from a bunch of different companies. I mean, all, basically every company you've probably heard of um, are involved in kind of driving those. You know, I mean, there's a ton of people that have joined this at this point. Um, and, then, and then the Open Container Initiative, which is another important thing that you should know, they govern the runtime spec and the image spec. And they also release a piece of software called Run C, which is an implementation of the runtime spec. And the runtime spec is what takes, you know, basically knows how to take that directory and that config file, as I mentioned, turn it into a container. But there's also governance around, you know, how you communicate with a registry server and what that format of that container image as you pull it down, which is actually a bunch of layers. It's actually not an image. It's actually a repository of a bunch of images. Um, how you pull that down and how you expand it on disk and present it to, you know, run C, basically. And then OpenShift has, you know, it, its upstreams are essentially all of these things, right? There's Kibana, Elasticsearch, Open vSwitch, which we use in RHEL, you know, as kind of the underlying. We create a flat network that's virtual in an OpenShift environment. That's, again, something the installer does. Um, but there's more, you know, there's more to setting up a Kubernetes environment. Getting to this requires more than just, you know, just Kubernetes. Like, you know, there's more. There's the installer. There's the configuring the network. Um, there's a lot of things. There's logging, et cetera. So does that make sense to everyone? Any questions? All right, so with that, um, I'm going to get us into, I want to kind of, I'm going to get us into the lab. We're going to do the first lab. And for those of you that have the lab guides, you're just going to do a real quick thing that everybody else will do. You're going to put your stickers in. And now you should know which order those stickers go in because I've presented it to you and you should understand that architecture. And so hopefully you all get it right. I'm going to check as you guys are going out the door. And if you get it wrong, you won't get a gold star. But, but I'm going to give you the URL. So, so this is the one that we want to get into. So we want to get into katakoda.com slash father Linux. Actually, if you can just get there, you can click through. So I, I'll show you. Like, If you can just get to katakoda.com slash father Linux, you'll end up getting to this page. Um, and then you can just click on Introduction to OpenShift for Developers. And then you'll get this page. And then you'll see, very obviously, we have Lab 1, 2, 3, and 4. We're just going to do Lab 1. And then we'll break. We'll probably do, like, um, we ran a little bit longer than I wanted to. So, well, we're about right where I want to be. We're going to give you about, I would say, like, 12-ish minutes, maybe 15 minutes to get through that one. Probably 15. We'll do 15. Um, actually, I'll set a timer. So you, to get into this environment, you have to create a username and password, which is described in the, in the lab guide. But um, here, let me just show you real quick. I'll log out so that you can kind of see. And then I'll start the timer. So if you do not, ha well, here's what will happen if you go to katakoda.com slash father Linux. So you'll go here. Oh. It'll show you this. You, know, you can click on intro to OpenShift. It'll show you this, and then you notice it doesn't show that this is completed anymore. You click on this scenario, and it will bring up this page. And so you're welcome to just use a throwaway email address and create a password, or you can use your GitHub to sign in. Um, you know, you can sign up for free, but this takes two seconds if you just use GitHub. I, I, I just used my GitHub because I was already developing in Katacoda, and it's pulling stuff from GitHub anyway. So. For me, it made sense to use GitHub, but you could sign in with anything. And then once you create an account here, this actually gives you access to anything that's on katacoda.com, and they're all free tutorials. So. And we can walk around and help anyone that has problems with that. But I'm going to start a timer for like 15 minutes for the first lab, and then we'll walk around and help people. But it should be very exp Oh, and one other thing. So oh, actually, before I turn you free, one other thing I want to run through is I'm going to sign in here, and then I want to show you something. So we're going to skip the video. We don't want to do the video on the first page because I basically just presented that. So right here is a video. If you get home and you want to do this entire thing, you can go through. You can watch the video. It's about the same length as what I just presented. And then you hit start after you watch the video. And then it will bring up, it will bring up a virtual machine on this side. 
Um, and on this side is kind of where the lab information, you know, where you read through this. And then I just want to show you, it'll take a while for this to start, but like each of these commands, you can actually just click on them and it will actually automatically put them into the terminal and type them. So there's no typos or anything. Honestly, this should go pretty quick. Um, these first ones are pretty easy. And so, although it looks like some of you are already getting in because this is taking a while. Um, I don't know, I've never seen it take this long. Yeah, so we're going to have to wait and see how fast Catacoda is. Say that one more time. Yes, OpenShift, yeah. OpenShift is, the question is, is OpenShift open source? And yes, it's like everything else Red Hat does. Everything is open source. So the upstream of OpenShift is called OpenShift Origin. And OpenShift Origin is built off Kubernetes and all of those other things I showed. So like Kibana and all these other projects. It's, think of it as a distribution that pulls all these tools together, very similar to like Fedora pulls things together. And then OpenShift, uh, OpenShift Container Platform is built off OpenShift Origin. And Origin is very similar to Fedora. It changes quickly and pulls all those things together and kind of you know, proves it out and makes sure it works. And then our enterprise distribution is OpenShift. And this, this lab here, if it ever comes up, is built off OpenShift Origin. Although now I'm getting worried. Hmm. Yeah. Yours is working? OK. Has anyone got in? OK, good. So only mine. If not, just refresh. This uses, I, I, if I remember right, I think he's using Amazon on the back end, so it should try a different VM if like, this doesn't work. Red Hat's paying for the cost of it, so I don't care. <laughs> just create another VM. No, mine's really hanging now. Huh. Let me try this completely from scratch. This is a good stress test for Summit. No, I, I logged out. I think it'll work now. We'll see. I've had to do this before. It's not working for you either? I can't get in either. I waited about three minutes and it, it did come through. It did come through? Okay. I was worried about this many people connecting to it at once. There, there is some on the networking, yeah, in there, in a later lab. I think under the single host tool chain we dig in a little bit. Um, I have more material I want to add, actually, around the way Kubernetes does it, because it's, it's interesting, and I think it's important to understand and know, but I, don't, I haven't added it yet. I will eventually add it. <laughs> you, can e you, can, you can bug me on Twitter and say, hey, go create that content. <laughs> and under social pressure, I will do work.
this thing is not that comfortable. How many of you are still waiting to get in? A decent amount. Eh. Like four, seconds. four seconds for you? What? Let me try another one. I just want to see if it's my browser. I know it's not the internet for sure. It's not that. Who's asking for five minutes? What five minutes for what? For what? It was supposed to go till it's supposed to be an hour and a half. I don't think this is right. <laughs> it's just when I thought the lab couldn't go any worse. <laughs> we get kicked out. Yeah, that's true. It can always get worse. If there was a fire, like, right here. I mean, a big fire. Not a little one. I would run away, but. Oh, here we go. This one got through. So probably just reload it a couple times if you're still waiting, if you're impatient, because the other one I got got through. That's what I'm thinking, yeah. What? It takes two times to do what with a container? To pull the container. Yeah, th that, that could slow it down, but I don't, these are all separate virtual machines in Amazon, so it should work. Like, it shouldn't be broken, but. Oh well. Well, I got one through. But either way, I want to show I'll show you guys for those of you that are not in, but like basically what we do, what we're going to do here is like, you know, you literally just click on the command and, you know, then it'll basically type it in and you'll see this is pulling the image down. It's going to run it. It is definitely going slower. Yeah. So we're all getting crushed. So apparently having this many people is tough for Catacoda. Yeah. Yeah, that's high. Probably. Yeah. But the script is not on standard path, and I found it only here. It's because it hasn't completed yet. You probably, it probably somehow. No, so there's an intro. Step, step, step number three. So I, I, I'm, I'm really, I'm really far. Yeah, but I but fixed that. Huh? Okay, I so it is the, the right script. So it is the so right script, and it should be working, Juan. Watch. Mine will, yeah. it should be the path. But it should work because there's a, there's a script at the beginning that I copy it into user bin. What I'm thinking is, is since it's so slow, the in, the, 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 there's like a, I, I could show you in this, but there's, there's basically. Like, you know, it's functional because I can run Docker containers with those stop and everything works. Just maybe final step wasn't. No, it's, it's, it's what he says. So basically uh -huh. the profile doesn't. No, the problem is, is, is it's not done configuring itself. I understand, I understand. Yeah, on the no. back end, it's so slow. Some of, those steps Some of the steps haven't completed yet. Yeah, that's what I think is happening. 
So here, you can see it right here in uh, intro open shift in container internals lab one. This file right here is what configures that VM as it comes up. And so like since there's so many of us doing it, you see it copies this script into, into user bin. I think it just hasn't gotten there yet. Even though I put it before all these ones, so maybe the git clones are not, I don't know what's happening. They're not done yet. Yeah. Yeah. I was fearful that this would happen. Yeah, can you make the can you make Catacoda work better? No, I think No, that will not help. Because they would have to cut and paste this and connect a bunch of people and it would be a nightmare. No, the problem would be we'd have to describe to everybody how to get in and it would end up not working. Yeah, they're all on different networks and who knows what. And then two, the commands are all pro, like, these commands are configured for only this environment. I mean, there's a ton of configuration to this environment. On the back end, there's a ton of configuration to this environment to make this all work. Like, right, none of these commands would work on a generic OpenShift cluster. Does it not want to take more time than you do it than everybody wants to tell them? I th I'm thinking that might be the case. I'm thinking maybe we just have everybody get out of Catacoda. Would, would we, let's have a vote. Would it make more sense for me to just run through them and show them to you as opposed to having everybody try to do them? Is anyone massively against that? All right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what you mean. Say that one more time. No. Yeah, I think, I think the problem is it's so slow that the configuration isn't finished yet because there's so many of us into it. So I don't know how. I guess everyone hit log out, like get, get to the log out part and hit it because it seems to kill the VMs then kind of, I think. So let's try that. Let's everyone log out. All right, is everyone logged out? Did you click on log out? <laughs> Don't just shut your laptop because the VM will just keep running. All right, now let's see if this works. This is a, an experiment. It worked so beautiful all day as I tested. This part is so fast. Huh? Eh? That looks better. It would, but I have it so. So I have this under my profile. I have two versions of this lab. I have one that is like a GitHub repo, but you would have to create your own OpenShift environment. And it, it walks you through the same things. It's the older version. But you have to like basically set everything up and make it work right. It's, it would, it's a decent amount of setup to get an OpenShift working the way you want it you know, to make it work for this lab. Um, but this all, when it, when it works, is beautiful because it just all is already configured the right way and you don't have to mess around. Honestly, if you do this interact, if you do this by yourself later, it will probably just work. 
because there won't be 50 of us all connecting at the same time. Although this still is not, it's still slow. Oh. <laughs> we may be falling back to plan C, which may be I can present more material and we can interactively discuss it. And then, and then we can do the labs, we can do the labs later on your own and then if you have Anything in the lab that you don't understand, feel free to email me or, or tweet, you know, whatever, whatever, you know, basically. Yeah, you can phone you as well. Call me, too. You have my phone number now. <laughs> Remember, it's plus one to dial the United States. No collect calls, though, please. Um, yeah, it's dying. <laughs> I don't even know what it's doing anymore. Uh, it's definitely dead. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go complain. Um, all right. So. So, all right. So you know what we'll do? We'll dig into the next lab, and you know we'll talk through some this stuff. So, I have enough material that we can probably fill out. I mean, when does this go till? It goes till 45, right after. So 5:45. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that's just about perfect. Actually, now that we've killed a bunch of time. So. So container image is the next thing um, where I dig in. Actually, actually, it's single host tool chain, really, but, but, um, and container images. Um, so um, I get this question all the time. And, and I have different versions of this drawing that are easier and more complex, depending. I'm hoping that since you're in a container internals class, most of you are pretty technical. You can handle the harder version of this. But at the end of the day, you know, like, I would argue in an old, in a, in a traditional environment, whether it's actually virtual or not, you can, you can add or remove this bottom piece if you want. But you know, most of the time, we optimize for agility just with the application, right? I mean, the OS dependencies in the kernel, we optimize for stability. And those are two competing engineering paradigms. So you know, Red Hat, for example, with Fedora, moves very quick. Every six months, new version, no problem. RHEL, it's 10 years, 13 years. We backport changes. That's a ton more work, right? Because it takes a, it takes a ton of work to backport changes. But the nice part is every time you run a yum update in rel, it works. Not every time in Fedora does it work. You know, not every time in any operating system I've used. Actually, there's two that I've never been burned by. I'm a Red Hat person, but I'll fully admit I've never been burst, burned by SUSE Enterprise Linux. I have been burned by every other distribution of Linux that exists. Um, they're mostly optimized for speed, not for, you know, for, for stability. Um, but, but in a production environment, you know, typically you would just you would, you would use something like RHEL or CentOS or SUSE or something, and it would move pretty slowly, but, and it would backport changes, but, but you know, only the application. In a containerized environment, since now this is basically what we have in the container, we have the application and all the OS dependencies, which you would run through in the lab and see when you do like LDDs on binaries and look at all the dependencies, um, which a lot of people that have forgotten Unix and Linux probably don't remember. Um, you would see how these OS dependencies get bundled in, in the operating system in a, inside the container image. Um, but then in this one, I show kind of how, here's like multiple container hosts. They can still run as VMs. It doesn't matter, right? If you run OpenShift out on AWS, they're still VMs, so it doesn't matter either way. Um, they could be bare metal or VMs. Um, and so this is the part that we're going to dig into. So, so if you kind of think of an operating system as this stack of stuff, there's user programs. Those user programs are linked against libraries, interpreters. Uh, you know, depending whether it's a Python script, you know, it relies on an interpreter. If it's a C program, it relies on other libraries. Sys those libraries, glibc, a lot of people don't understand this. This is a nuanced thing that I think we've forgotten about over time is glibc is the standard set of interfaces that we use for system calls. It defines essentially what uh, the, the set of API calls that we can make into the kernel is. Those, those are all documented. So like file open, file read, you know, the system, uh, uh, you know, fork, exec, all of those, and a lot of you should know that if you've programmed, you've probably used these functions, maybe never fully understood that they're actually part of the interface to the kernel, um, and those are called system calls. They're special, they're different than like in .NET where there's other higher level things where it's like get stream and like all these other functions that are not part of the core, you know, piece that, you know, you rely on the kernel for. Um, these are published and, and, and documented in glibc. And so only the ones that are in glibc are considered the public interface. There are other secret 
ones that I don't want to call them secret, non-documented ones, those are liable to change. They're not necessarily you know, governed by the same kind of stability requirements as GLBC, although Linus does beat people up if they change anything in that syscall interface. Um, but, but a lot of people, I think, have forgotten this. You know, like this is knowledge that is kind of common in the Linux world, or at least deep, you know, people that really understand Unix that come from that background. Um, but we've forgotten it with containers, and we just think, oh, well, I'll run a container, it's abstracted, it'll just work. And you're like, well, it depends. You know, when you run a web server, a web server probably uses, we, we had a discussion two days ago, uh, Bird of a Feather, where we talked about how many syscalls does a web server use? I don't know, 20, 30, 50, it doesn't use the 300 that are part of this interface. You know, I think I counted in RHEL, it's like 381 or 387 system calls that are documented. Um, in, and so, so uh, you know, we don't use, most applications don't use every single system call. But if you think about what an interpreter is, or even a bash script, you can actually execute any system call. It's what we call a Turing complete problem. So a Turing complete problem means that until the program is running, it can run interactively. And literally, imagine if I wrote bash. Bash is essentially a Turing complete problem, because inside of bash, you can execute anything you want. And so anything that the user's imagination can come up with, they can even run undocumented syscalls. They can, you know, they could write a little C program that basically puts the kernel into different modes. I mean, you can do anything you want. So we call that a Turing complete problem. When you're, all you're running is a web server, that is not Turing complete. There's a finite set of syscalls that that code can make. But when you write a form in that, in that web server that then allows somebody to type commands in and the, and the web server tries to run those commands, you now introduce a Turing complete problem. And so, so like, there's a balance of like, of like, most of the time things just work if you put them in a container, but you do have to be careful about mixing and matching user spaces and kernels. And also, as workloads expand beyond web servers, you'll end up with a problem of there are certain things that access slash proc and slash sys and expect things to be in a certain place. And so if your app is funky, or AKA not a web server, like say it's an HPC application that needs slash sys for something because it's trying to access something in some funky way, it's some legacy thing, you could end up in scenarios where you're, you have very incompatible container images from the container host if you're not using, you know, like, like RHEL 7 on RHEL 7. And so people kind of need to think through this entire stack as they're building their applications. Um, so going, going further more into the, into the actual like image side, there's a ton of nuance that I think, again, a lot of people haven't captured all the way in their mind. We do a Docker run and it just seems super easy, right? You go Docker run, RHEL 7 bash, and it just works, it's magic. And you don't really think through what's actually happening. Um, the OCI and Docker, you know, basically Docker, which became OCI, basically the image format, kind of has the concept of these tags. And there's a bunch of different layers in these, in these repositories. We refer to these as container images. We say the word container image all the time, but it's not an image. It's actually a repository, and it's basically layers and tags. And these tags, we usually use these tags to represent a version of the software because it's a natural thing to represent in the layers and the tags, but that is not necessarily true. We could have two different configurations. We could have configuration A and configuration B, and configuration A could use version 3.0, and this could use th version 3.0. The, the concept of using these layers and tags as versions of the actual software inside of the container image is purely like a de facto standard. It's what most people do. It's not necessarily what's mandated to do, and it's, part of, it's not part of the image spec in any way, shape, or form. So this will come up as you roll this thing out to developers and people start to argue about what you should and shouldn't use tags and layers and images for, you know, essentially repositories and how you should break them down. In fact, we had this internal debate at Red Hat when we were building our, our registry and people were trying to figure out how, well, do you put RHEL 7 in a separate repository? And actually, I'm getting ahead of myself, but so, so here's the next piece of it that adds to the complexity, right? This is what a URL looks like. Um, you know, it, you, you pull this, registry.access.reddit.com slash rel7 slash rel colon latest. So latest points to whatever the dot release of rel is, and, and then rel7 is the major release, and it's part of the repository, uh, or the namespace, I'm sorry. And then, you know, and then of course you pull all of the images from Red Hat's registry. Um, but these are like, they're arbitrary definitions. They, they're not mandated by anything. Like, like, and so you have to remember that when you go to architect your own systems because, because it seems so easy when you go to pull it, like instinctively you just look at the URL and you understand what that means. 
but it's not intuitive when you get somebody in your group that goes and uses it for something else. And you go, why did they, I'll give you an example. I go to Docker Hub and Rel, or CentOS 4, 5, 6, or I think it's 5, 6, and 7, or maybe 6 and 7, are all in the same repository. That seems like insanity to me. Like that seems like something that you should never do. Like in my opinion, you want separate major releases in different namespaces because you don't want to run Docker run CentOS and one day it's just CentOS 8 and everything you had just broke because you had no idea that it was going to roll to version 8 on Tuesday. Like, I mean, that's crazy, but it's how it will work right now. Like, the way it's configured on Docker Hub, when CentOS 8 comes out, your stuff's all going to break. So, like, you really have to think through this stuff and really understand what these things mean. And it's so easy to use, but it's so hard to design a new system using the same tools. You have to understand it, like, five times as well as you understand it, you know, when you first start using it. And this is all from internal arguments and debates that we've had. Um, the next thing that, that like, kind of getting deeper with the images. Um, yeah. So these are all different tags that represent different image layers. But actually something that I don't show on this is you can actually have like image layer, image layer, tag, image layer, image layer, tag, image layer, image layer, image layer, tag. There's a bunch of unnamed image layers in between the tags. There can be, I should say. You get all those layers. Pulls all the layers down. And they're all different. They're essentially blobs of data. And they all, there's a JSON file called a manifest. And you pull that manifest down. The Docker daemon looks, or actually I should say container D, whatever library it uses to pull those, basically looks at that and says, oh, I need this image, this image. It crawls this and basically says, oh, I, to, to, actually it doesn't even crawl it. It actually looks at the JSON file and says, oh, to create this tag, to build up all the layers I need for this tag, I need to pull this, 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 and this, this, and it pulls those all down. And that's what you're seeing that little bar go across. All that magic's happening in the background for you. Then once it gets on disk, it's actually exploding it out into a directory, creating a config file, handing that off to run C, and then it gets ran. And exploding it on disks uses what's called a, I'm getting ahead of myself because that's actually the next thing, but that uses what's called a graph driver. And that's that translation between all those image layers into a single directory on the system. And all that's happening, magic, right? You don't even know how that happens. But it's happening <laughs> every time. Not the whole history, only the path that builds up to your tag that you've pulled. Because there can be dead end branches. And actually, sadly, I show you that in the lab. So you can have a tree structure of stuff. And if you, if you traverse down this tree structure, well, if you pull a tag that's down this tree structure, Docker is smart enough, and so are all the libraries that pull images. They're smart enough to only pull that, only pull the set of things that you need to get to that one. They don't pull all the other ones necessarily. So like, you only pull the layers that you need to build the tag that you've decided that you want. You can also randomly pull a layer. You don't have to pull a tag. That's another thing people don't realize. You can pass it this big ID, and it will just pull only that thing. And it will pull down to an image. And then when you go to run that, it can be completely broken. That's another thing that people don't realize. You, tags are a way for you to communicate to the end user as an image builder, here is how I think you should use this image or this repository. You're like, if you want to use version 4.0, call the 4.0 tag. If you want to use version 4.0.1, use that. And then latest always points to whichever the latest one is which again kind of insinuates that, hey, we should be using version numbers with these tags, but it's not necessarily the case. And then any image layer in between could be a half-baked image that kind of half works. Like, you know, if you ever look at a Docker file, every one of the lines basically builds a layer. And you could literally, like, you know, if you kind of look at a Docker file and say it says hello, you know, puts a user in there, adds a user, adds a user, and then does some other stuff. You could pull like here and the software is not even actually copied to where it needs to be in the image yet. So you could pull down a half broken like shell of, an, of, a, of a container, try to run it, be inside of it with bash, you know, and look around and it won't work. It's like a non-functional image. That's very possible with Docker. A, a tag is just tagging to a layer that already exists. Yeah, you, those tags are basically for specific layers that already exist. The layer and the tag are two different things, basically. 
every layer has an ID. A tag is a named ID. That's a, a one that you expect a human to use. You're, you're essentially communicating, hey, this is a layer that I expect you to use. Does that make sense? It's kind of like GitHub. I mean, it's just kind of the same thing. You wouldn't just pull, except that we, we, you can pull broken things from GitHub in the exact same way. If somebody makes commits and you're like halfway, but they need to make a few more commits to get it to a point where it works again, and then somebody pulls like just, you know, check, you know, just, now, now we always pull like, again, the latest one, which should, should point to something that actually works. Oh, another question. Can you repeat the question? Forget it. <laughs> yes, I can. I'm sorry. Hopefully that was enough description that you under... I don't know what he asked anymore. I forget. But you, you don't have multiple namespace levels in order to operate across part of the stack. So how would you handle that in this regard? Because that's where Hub does Apple and Node or HL, but for other software as well. Um, the question is, yeah. Yeah, I have. I can actually demo it too with DocViz. It's in the lab to show you with a tool called DocViz. All right, so let me repeat the question. The qu question is not a full question, by the way, uh, but I will repeat what you said in, a, in what I think you are asking. Um, you said there's not multiple namespaces. There's no multiple namespace levels, and they're all regular, Correct. So, so, all right, so what he's asking is, since there are not multiple namespaces, like there's only one if you go to like Docker Hub, like, like how would you represent, you know, like other things, right? So that's, again, one of those things that's kind of like a de facto standard. Like if you go to docker.io, there's only one namespace. If you go to Red Hat's registry server, there's only one namespace. There are a lot of registry servers that allow you to create multiple namespaces internally, which creates a whole other cluster of problems. Because now, you, you know, developers or whoever architects may want to create arbitrary meanings for each of these namespaces. And, and you're right, they're not, there's no, that's left on your shoulders to figure that out, which can be a pain in the butt. I mean, I've ran into that. So, does that make, I mean, does that, yeah, I. How, because you said that you would post one namespace for Red Hat Versa, for example, how would you do that in the public? No, no, you, well, no, layers is different. Registry or namespace, having multiple namespaces this way is different than this way. I mean, we have, I mean, any, any Docker registry has, can have different namespaces. You just can't have multiple layers of namespaces where it's like slash rel, slash rel six, slash rel six dot four, slash rel, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you can't keep adding slashes, but you can have different namespaces this way. So you can have, you can have redhat.com slash rel seven, redhat.com slash rel six, you know, and we have that now. And so does every registry has that. Docker.io has that. It, it, by default, they only have, if you go to docker.io, like, um, oops. Hopefully this works. I thought that's how you did it. Maybe I'm doing it wrong. Hub.docker.com slash CentOS. I don't know. It's, I think it's, you need the, the thing in it. I think you need, ah, I'm going to just go to it because it, it'll be easier than me farting around. But, uh, so if you look at the URL, I thought it needed that slash, it needs this underscore. So this is a default namespace, right? And <laughs> what that means is it means basically go to the repository and just, and, and just, you know, like, like, like always use that same repository. The problem with that right there is that look at these tags. So like, Six, six, seven, six, eight, seven, one. You're when this rolls to CentOS eight, you're screwed. Like you're getting CentOS eight. So like in this scenario, I really recommend using a tag because if you don't use a tag, you're you're in deep doo doo. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. You should do that anyway, but you're really in deep doo doo because CentOS is only compatible within you know minor versions, not major versions. But they could, if they chose had, they could choose to have not just the default namespace, but, the, but, the, but, but have multiple namespaces that define different major pieces of software. Again, personally, I think that's a bad architectural decision. They wanted simplicity publicly. In your private registry, you probably care more about clarity than having weird, easy to use things like that for marketing purposes, you know. Sorry, all right, good. Yeah.
Yes, correct. So if the latest thing that becomes simply safe, then we, this is the case we're screwed. Yes, exactly. And if you do it with Red Hat's registry, you're less screwed, although I would still argue never do this because it's a bad idea. You will still probably get screwed. But, but you are less screwed because we have a rel7 namespace, and so the worst thing that would ever happen is if you use the latest tag, you would go from rel7.4 to 7.5. And mostly, as most people that have used rel, it's pretty stable. Like, like that user space doesn't change that much. There's an ABI, API compatibility guarantee. Guarantee. It's not a guarantee. I always get yelled at not to say that. But, but essentially, we publish a document that says we attempt to maintain ABI API compatibility in all the you know in, in all of the group one I think they're called or user space tools. There's we have different layers of user space tools, but all the core ones like glibc things like that are very very stable. So the chances of an app breaking with this are even if you use the latest tag are way less than than if you have major versions in the in the repository. But this is something to think through yourself. You have to decide how you want to architect that if you're building your own environment. But it's, it's more than I think. Again, it's so easy to type Docker run, but then you, when you go to build this stuff yourself, you just willy-nilly build stuff without thinking, and then things break in strange ways because you didn't think through it. So I, I, I'm just highlighting problems that we've seen, you know, basically. Any other questions? All right, so not, the next thing that always comes up going deeper into uh, images is people always like, like this is one that I run into every customer I talk to, they always ask. So like now the developer just controls everything, right? And you're like, well, not exactly. I mean, if you think about it, a user space in an operating system is a bowl of soup or it's like stew of soup, right? Like, and we had always argued about what should be in the soup. You know, we would argue like, should you have garlic? Should you have more pepper or should you have salt? Developers and, and sysadmins argued about this. I know that's my, I hear this stupid thing. I think that's my, uh, oh, I thought that was my thing making that high pitched noise, but it's not. Um, but, but basically, you know, it's always been a collaboration in user space. And so if you think through what configuration management is, it's automation to help you configure the user space. If you think through what YUM and RPM are, they're automation to help you configure the user space and getting more and more advanced tooling, right? So, so RPM is kind of the first one. Then you have YUM, which manages dependencies. Think of RPM as the set of things for them to transfer, you know, for the package maintainer to transfer knowledge to you, right? Here's how you should, you know, install this thing and run it. Um, and then you think of YUM as here's all of the knowledge of what it requires to install itself. Then you think of Ansible as here's the stuff that we want to add to it that actually makes it run the way we want. And so, like, there are other tools to build images. Docker files become that. But really, this is all about user space collaboration and controlling what's happening in that user space. Just because you put it in a container does not change that at all. Everything has changed and nothing has changed. You still end up with this problem where, where historically, middleware people want to do crazy stuff. They, I mean, every Java person I know is like, pulled down a tarball, ran it, works. And you're like, OK, that's not, that doesn't really make me happy as a sysadmin. Like, I'm kind of like, that's crazy. But they're like, yeah, I pulled down six different JVMs. They're all running in like slash user. I'm like, why did you put it in slash user? You're like, that should go in like opt at a minimum or like in user local or something, whatever. Either way, this thing still happens. Um, even in a container, you're still going to get into this argument. And then, you know, and then the app developers are just like, whatever, we have a WAR file. We don't care, right? So like, the nice part is with a container image, you at least now are speaking a standard language, right? Like, if the operations team says, hey, we're going to pull down the rel7 image, we're going to modify it in a certain way, add some stuff, like whatever the stuff is, security stuff, scanning tools, whatever they want to add to it, maybe just simple things like libssl or whatever, um, you know, they're going to add that stuff because this is, a, this is a concept of DRY, like do not repeat yourself, right? So, like, if you're going to have glibc, you don't want to have different versions of glibc in every single middleware build. So like, if you have a Ruby image and a Python image and a Perl image, you don't want them to all have the same copy of, of you know, different copies of the same stuff. You don't want them, you don't want to install like the SSH libraries like three different times with three different versions and have everybody have their own version if possible because that creates massive problems and it's DRY, it's a dry problem. So now at least whatever the operations team goes and builds, they, maybe they do it with a Docker file. Maybe they do it with something like Ansible Container, which helps build images in a way very similar to Docker files, except using Ansible code, which again is a collaboration of changing how you change the user space. Um, they, you know, maybe there's like rel7 core build, and that's actually what I create. Like when I, I have some demos that I do, maybe that's what the operations team puts in the registry server, 
Let's everyone use that. It says this is the single source of truth. We've added all the stuff that our company wants, like all the magical stuff that records if you type commands or does whatever weird stuff that your operations team wants that makes your life either harder or easier. Um, and then hands it off to the middleware team. And the middleware team's like, well, we pulled down our tarballs. You're like, well, make a Docker file that pulls down those tarballs. And then also, oh, by the way, the fact that you're pulling that from an, an external red, you know, web server is not going to fly. So like, make sure you copy all that stuff locally, blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, you get to now negotiate that stuff. And at least it's all in a, like, it's in a language, like either Ansible or Docker file or whatever you end up using to build that container image. At least now it's codified. Like, it's at least codified. And now you have a single. And then again, the next time you, that maybe you create a standard JVM, a standard, you know, web application server that's Java based. Maybe you create a standard Perl image, a standard Python image. And then you have these experts in like either databases or Ruby or Python help craft that image the way you want it. And then everybody that has a Ruby app uses, you know, that version of it. Or you can branch as necessary and you should use layers as necessary. But you shouldn't think that just because you have layers, like the entire problem of collaboration with other people goes away. Like that doesn't go away magically with containers. You don't just let the end developer build whatever they want into the thing and then just like do whatever they want and then have 50,000 different permutations of images in your environment. You don't want that. Like, you know, that's still a bad thing. So, and then the other, the next thing that people always get confused about, they're like, well, okay, we'll just create 50,000 permutations, let developers do whatever they want, and then like, how do you solve this problem? So, so say, you, say you create 50,000 different images, all with like different versions of libssl in them, and then one day the security team says, oh, by the way, we need libssl at version whatever, X, Y, Z, and you go, okay, well, developers have fun patching your 50,000 different images, like, I mean, like, that's never going to fly, right? Like, it's never going to fly in a production environment. So at some point, you hope that you have this model set up so that the operations team and the different middleware teams, I call Perl and Python middleware, which a lot of people get mad about, but whatever. Java people really get mad about it. But, uh, but I consider anything that kind of sits on the OS that doesn't exactly do anything yet that needs you know, an app to run kind of middleware. Um, you know, Basically, at some point, you're going to want like a cascading version of this, where maybe you have 10 different types of middleware. But when you update the core build, all the middleware builds get rebuilt, and all the applications get rebuilt. And that is really painful for people to understand. I mean, but you have to crystal clear understand this. Like, you have to be ready to rebuild this stuff at any time, and it has to have cascading builds. So every time, okay, so the question is, is, would all of the tags get rebuilt if you change the core image? And the answer is no. So you would end up building a new tag. That new tag would be a new version, right? So like, so like you wouldn't go back and, pat, I mean, you could set up an environment that would do that, but that would be insanity. And the chances of making that work 100% is probably near zero. So, so you know, imagine if you had a five-year-old application and you're going to try to rebuild every version of that application off the new image. I'm almost guaranteeing that there are time constraints in there where things will get misaligned and they won't work. You would pro the way I've done it is always just build the latest again. Like so build a new version. So like it would be 4.0.0 dash 135. You know how Red Hat does build numbers? We do like if you have bash, you know, 2.6.5 dash 275 or if you look at the kernel it'll be like 2. Dot, you know, or 3.10 seven or whatever, I don't know what it is right now, you know, dash, and it'll always have a build number. I would just use a build number is what I would do. And then always roll the build number forward. And then this gets into the infrastructure that's nexus necessary for CI CD. You have to be able to do that. You have to think through this before you can get to CI CD. How do you arrange for these cascading rebuilds? Uh, is it something OpenShift can do for you or it is something that OpenShift can do as long as you use build configs. So I have a demo. Actually, I was going to do it in the lab. There's the one where I pull down a GitHub repo that I've built that shows this working. You use cascading builds. So build configs are an object in OpenShift, which are another Kubernetes object, basically. And they have what are called triggers. And they interact with what we call image streams. And it's a lot for me to explain without drawings. but but. Basically, image streams are kind of a spider web, and any time an image changes, it can trigger other things to happen. And it's a way for like event-driven automation to happen inside of OpenShift. And so whenever the core build gets built, it will send off a trigger, say, hey, core build's been rebuilt. Go rebuild all the other things that depend on this core build. 
after you know all those things get built, all the applications that are built on top of those get built, and you can cause this cascading wave of images to happen. Of course, you would never want that in production. You'd want to do that in a dev environment where you rebuild all the images, make sure everything works, have smoke tests, have CI/CD, that ready run the app, run all the smoke tests for the app, make sure all those apps work. But people don't think through this. Like like they think, oh, I'll just move to container images and it'll stay static forever and it'll be fine. But that's not the case. In fact, it's it's going to be more painful if you haven't thought through all this stuff because, because you're going to end up with a bunch of different images that are all stuck in some specific state for a long time and, and they could end up with security issues and no, you know, two years later the developer doesn't even know how to rebuild it yet and if there's no tests, you're going to be in a really bad state. You know, you're going to be like firing up a version of the container, manually patching it, then saving it and exporting it and trying to, but you're going to end up in that same crafty, you know, crufty way that, that you've had on the old Unix system that nobody wants to touch. Yep. All right. I know your question, so I'll repeat it. So he's saying, so if you build a new version of the core build, how will it, and you tag it with a new version, and the developer did what they should do, which is use a specific tag. So like say it was 1.0.0, and you roll the core build to 1.0.1, and the developer has specifically used 1.0.0, and you, the cascading build will never happen, right? Well, it'll happen. It'll just rebuild with the old version because the build config will trigger a new build, and all those cascading builds will happen, but you'll never get a new version. That is true. That is a problem. So you have to, you have to think through that. So the core build will definitely want to use, definitely want to use a, a tag to only pull the specific version from Red Hat that you want, right? But maybe the middleware team should use the latest tag, and maybe the developer should use the latest tag to cause those cascading builds to happen. And so if they don't want it to happen, then they can call a tag, but then they're on their own, right? So now it becomes policy. You're like, okay, fine. If you don't want to use latest, you don't trust the internal supply chain of software, go figure it out yourself. Sorry, this guy's first. I don't quite understand the, the question. You know what? I was, I was hoping that uh, at some point of the presentation we would tackle this issue, so maybe I will come back later. Yeah, I, I kind of understand what you're saying. You're saying there is, there, where, where, what image are you pulling? Can you give the actual example? Um, let's say it was, a, it was, a, it was a, a sentry server. A sentry is a, it's the most recent term. Okay. Is it something you pulled from external? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, ba imagine, imagine. Basically, you're extending an existing image, and when the base image changes, all your image is changing. Is this the case? Sorry, yes, so you are using a base image, you are extending your container with uh, your own uh, uh, data or whatever you want to, to apply then, and when this base image changes, you need to rebuild it. This is the change. This is the, the, the case. Okay, so, me, me. so I know what you're talking, I, 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 I think it clicked for me. I think I know what your question is. So I'll repeat it and then you tell me if you think this is it. So whatever configuration file they used in their Docker file, 
they didn't deliver that with the Docker file. All you have is the Docker file, and you see that they're pulling some external configuration file, but you don't have access to that stuff. OK, because that's one I've seen. We, we actually have that problem with software collections, where we don't actually deliver to you some of the missing stuff. So if you go to rebuild the software collections yourself, you will be in a world of hurt, because you don't actually have all the stuff that you need to rebuild them. That's a common pattern problem that I've seen. Yeah, yeah, no worries. We can chat offline, too. So that's the end of that one. I mean, that's, that is images, right? So like, I tried to tackle some like pretty deep problems, but like the idea is that like this stuff is so easy to use, right? But like you have to go back to all the Unix stuff that you understand. Like the Linux stuff doesn't change. You still have a dependency manager like Yum. You still have package managers like RPM. You've now added new tools like Docker and Builda, which is one that Red Hat has, Ansible, Container, things like this to build new images. But all these business problems that you have, which is basically how do people collaborate to build a user space the way you want, is still, it still exists inside of container images. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I can de well, I can demo some of it if you want. Is it working fine? Oh, all right, sweet. Um, there it is. <laughs> Mine never started. Hopefully, this will start now. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's way faster. So now you guys get to see what it's like now. All right, see, that's how it happens normally, um, which is actually really nice. Um, uh, actually, you know what, I don't, the problem is, the question you asked is like, what happens when you pull an image? I want to, I have it in a lab, I can't quite remember where it's at is the problem. Um, I think it, oh, actually, I know, it, I know it's not here, hold on. It's in, it's in, I just walked through the lab two stuff, so I know it's there. So, so this, this lab actually goes exactly through what I said. So, okay, so the image isn't pulled yet, but let's pull an image and we'll do a little experimentation on it just to show you what's happening. See how much faster that is? Oh, God, this is better. Don't all get in it. Yeah, in fact, if you get into Katakoda, did you notice at the beginning the videos are right there? They're embedded inside. Oh, I don't think I added three and four yet. I think two's there. I think one and two are there, but I don't think three and four. I will add them soon. There. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, so, so, oops, what happened? Oh, this is some weird thing I've been seeing lately. You've got to go back. I don't know why it's doing this. Um, so, so long story short, so he, you can do a couple things. You can look at the history of an image with Docker, which shows you kind of like what, this is basically showing you kind of what got created in the Docker file. And that, now, you're going to find that with Red Hat images, we do what we call squashing them. So you, you don't see all these layers created. We actually have a, a, a tool called Image Factory, I think is what it's called. And it basically takes the exact same thing that it does to create an ISO image and our VMDK images and our AWS images. And it just creates a Docker image. And you know, so it's squashed, so you won't see much. Um, if I change this, you know, you'd see a bunch of things. Um, oh, you know what's sad is I, I'd go through that, what you're asking, like seeing the different image layers. Um, I do it in this exercise. And the challenge is uh, it would take a long time to build right now. So like, you have to build a Docker file. You, know, you have to use a Docker file that has multiple lines so that it will create multiple layers. And then what I do is I show you the tree structure, you know, and I could show you that if it pulls one tag, if you pull one tag, you'll see the thing go across, and it will pull down all the image layers that it needs to get to that tag. But if you pull a different tag, like say you pull, if you pull tag like 7.4 or whatever, and then later you pull 7.5, you'll see it pull some more information down because it's pulling different image layers to kind of traverse the tree, you know, down to a different version, you know, a different version of the tag. Does that make sense? I can't really demo it because I'd have to, I'd have to do a lot of stuff to like really show you it. 
That was your question, right? Yeah. All right, I'll get through real quick. I will try to go through the third one. That was as far as I was gonna get anyway, was number three, and then, and then you're always welcome. I mean, this is all interactive, so you can do it yourself. Um, yeah. When you push, you push everything. Well, you push all the image layers that you've, that you've created. So, so when you think about what pushing is. So pushing is pulling an image down, pulling a tag down technically, pulling all the image layers that it's necessary to create that tag actually, then you add some stuff, and then you only push those differences back. And actually you don't even have to push those differences back, you could push those differences to a completely different repo. You could actually re-tag that image, so tagging in Docker actually changes the namespace, and the repository name, and the tag name. So that's actually something that I just thought through for the first time ever. The word tag, the directive, when you create tag, again, these are all, these are all um, arbitrary definitions for things, but the docker tag command allows you to re-tag that image with different namespace, a different registry server. You can literally relabel all that stuff that I showed you. Like, like I could show, you know, if you pull down an image, you, can, you could like do docker tag, this thing, then give it another name and change the registry, the, na the namespace, the repository, and the tag. And then you can push it somewhere else. And then it has to push all of the layers. Yeah, you can, because I've done it. So when you pull from one registry and push to another, you pull it down, you re-tag it, and you push. But it pushes all the exact same layers to this other registry server. Exactly. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep, exactly. There's a lot of these defaults like that that are ambiguous that you don't realize until you go to do it. Another one that is really common that I, I do in the lab is the name resolution. You could type docker pull CentOS. What happens? It uses the default namespace, it uses docker.io, and it pulls down the image. That's easy until you go to do something else. How do you set the default for your own registry? Better than that, if you pulled like the namespace slash the repository, uh, it, it actually, like, there's problems where actually, like, it won't find it if you, if, unless you, you like, it won't, normally it would pull the latest, but it doesn't know to do that because now you specify the namespace and the repository. And so then you have to actually specify latest. And so there's like all these weird arbitrary like resolution problems. So I would, that's something I forgot to tell you guys, just always use the full URL because if you don't, you will end up in a world of hurt at some point. It will cause you pain because you won't know exactly what you got. It's really nice for Docker pulls when you're playing but when you go to build something real, use the full URL because you will end up in URL hell. It's in the lab. I show you the different order where things break. It's insanity. It's like DNS that doesn't work right. You like have no idea. You're like, you're like, well, if I, you know, DNS is very specific and you know exactly how it's going to resolve. This doesn't have that. That's, that's a very good point. And the same is true with tagging. Tagging can be the whole thing or it can be just the tag or it could be the repository. In fact, I'm guessing you'd end up in namespace resolution problems if you don't specify the whole URL. I would guess, just taking a stab off the top of my head. I wouldn't even try it, let's put it that way. It's dangerous. So, um, so, so this is the next step. So I showed you the first step, right? I dug into user programs and interpreters and what's inside the container image. But now I dig into like the system calls in the kernel space, right? So now we're going down into the container host. So you can really think of the top two gears as the container images and the bottom two gears as the container host. And really, like, like it doesn't really change because of containers. It's the same tools and tool chain you're using. Um, but I, I, I always call it, you know, the container images are fancy files and the processes are just fancy processes. So if you do a file open with a process, right? Like if you write a bash script, you open a file, you cat a file, whatever. Cat uses uh, syscall open 
you know, then does a read, read whatever the heck, I, I don't even know what syscall it uses. You could trace it and watch that. Um, you know, but if you do it in a container, it does the same thing. So if you like cat slash Etsy Red Hat release or Etsy hosts, you know, it's doing a file open on that, reading all the data out, and then, and then, and then, and then putting it, you know, it basically uh, writing it to the terminal. So like, so like that happens, same thing that happens in a container, right? The only difference is you've now created it with a different SE Linux context in a C group with a different namespace. And what people don't understand a lot of times is that we, this came up uh, very crisply in the birds of a feather we did two days ago is, the clone syscall allows you to choose which namespaces you want. When you use Docker, by default, it uses all the namespaces that it's configured to use. You know, so it will use the process ID namespace, the network namespace, the, uh, I forget what the one is for time and, you know, or, or, and, and, and network, and, or I'm sorry, local host name, or host, there, there's, a, sorry, what was it? UTS. UTS, that's right, it's the weird one, UTS. So the UTS namespace. Um, but you can turn each one of them off when you do a clone syscall. So you can create a container that, a, a container, again, what is the definition of a container? You can create another process that is only in the network namespace of that container, but d isn't, isn't limited by its C groups, isn't limited by its SE Linux context, isn't even um, in the same process ID namespace. So if you do a PS, it'll just show everything on the box. And you realize, oh, wait a minute. I mean, a container's just in my mind. That's not a real thing, right? Like, it's, it's just a construct. It's a user space construct. But yet, we use the word as if it's real. So really, it's just a fancy process. And you can decide how thick you want this around this, right? Like, you can, you can isolate this thing in different ways. You can isolate just the network, not the network, just the process ID table, not the process ID table. And there's a bunch of different namespaces they can use. I don't remember how many. There's like seven or eight or 10 or something. Um, and then. And then so when you start multiple processes, you know, this is what it looks like, right? So like this is the global PID namespace, you know, the global PID data structure, right? So there's a process ID table inside the kernel. And if you think about what a process is, you know, it just adds another number to the process ID table. When you do PS, it just shows you all the information in that process ID table. It's just like doing stat on a file, right? Like it's just dumping the context of that, the contents of that process ID table. And inside of a namespace, a process ID namespace, it just creates another index. You know, it's just a different list of information that, that's separate from the global process ID. So it's like no different than a file. Like you understand the difference between having stuff in this file and in this file, right? Like it's, it's, just, it's just essentially you know, a, a sandboxed version of the process ID table. And then in a Red Hat world, we use C groups and SVIRT, uh, SecComp, SE Linux. We use all of these things to like add further isolation. But again, those are arbitrary constructs, they're not, that's not a standard. Not every Linux distribution does that. Some Linux distributions use AppArmor, some don't use anything. Um, sometimes they use some things like SE, uh, uh, you know, LXC, LXD, Docker, Rocket, they're all left to choose which ones of these technologies they want to use when they create a container. You know, there's no definition for that. And one last thing I should point out, the exec VE, so like if you do a PS in bash and you trace it, that's the, that's the system call that creates the PS or, or the subcommand, um, and and you notice like if you do a if you do a a, a a PS you know like it execs into that PS and then it returns, um, so it exec VEs into that and then it returns with a clone sys call it create you know in this one you may just have a process ID that in this particular example I'm only showing that it creates a process ID namespace you know and then and then that clone sys call this would be like a this would be like a little block of c code that you wrote yourself that just creates a process id namespace to kind of show how this works um, and then this would be like something like a docker container right like like where where like this one it would create all these namespaces you know so these are all the global ones and then these are all the namespaced ones so you see you can create a namespace around all of these things does that make sense to everyone? You kind of get to pick and choose the different data structures in the kernel that you want to basically virtualize at that moment as you start the process. And in fact, something people don't know with a clone syscall, there's actually no way to list easily all the namespaces that are on a kernel. Like you can't just like get namespaces and it just like shows you all the namespaces that are running. That, that, doesn't, that doesn't happen. That doesn't exist in the Linux kernel. I tried to mess with Eric Biederman and understand how or why. As a Unix admin for a long time, it made sense that I should just be able to see the namespaces. Like that seemed like something that I would, just, it seems like it should be a data structure, right? But it's not. There's not a concept of a container in the kernel, so there's no way to just list all of them. Um, 
there, are, but there are there are actually namespaces that get created. It's just and you can actually add like you can add another process to that namespace. Like you can actually add other uh, processes. So what people say is like, well, how do I get inside of a container? Well, you don't actually get inside of a container. You just add another process to the same namespace as the other one. And so like, that's a really mind-blowing concept for a lot of people. So when you do a Docker exec or a Kubernetes, kubectl exec and get into the container, you're actually just starting another process with a clone syscall and adding it to the same, to the same namespace as the other one. And then you just happen to be in that namespace. But what most people don't realize is you can actually use programs like nsenter, so namespace enter, and only enter part of the namespace. So like, you can like, just enter like, the network part and be able to do network traces and things like that but not be limited by its C groups, not be limited by its SE Linux rules, not be li limited by its process ID, you know, what it sees. And you can see other process IDs and things like that. And that's pretty mind-blowing for a lot of people. Yes. It, it essentially just creates another process in the same namespace. And in the Docker world, by construct, when you do the exec, it chooses all the same namespaces. Because that's the thing that's the most logical as a human being, right? Like when you want, but you can actually disable, like with, with a clone syscall, it has the potential to enable and disable different things. So like nsenter, for example, is more granular and you can control which namespaces you would enter. With a Docker exec, it just enters you into all of them. But that's by construct. That's not necessarily, it's not necessary, you know. And so then, here is a full rundown of what it looks like. Because, again, I think people have forgotten this stuff. So when you cat, you know, when you cat a file, you don't even think about it. You're like, I just cat a file, blah, blah. I've forgotten the hundreds of lines of code that, you know, whatever cat is to do this. So and actually, probably, you're probably executing more than that. I would imagine there's probably more than hundreds of lines when you get into the file system, the VFS layer, and all this other stuff that's happening. But this is what it looks like, right? You do an open syscall. Open syscall talks to the virtual file system layer. Virtual file system layer has a driver for XFS. XFS has a driver for whatever the block device is, and it finally accesses the blocks, right? But there's nothing different with a container. <laughs> the only difference is, is that the mount namespace is virtualized, so now the list of mounts looks different than the Unix system itself. It's a virtualized list of mount points, and it just happens that varlib MySQL in the container is mounted on you know, some other volume. But it still has to go to the, the VFS layer, the XFS layer, and the block device, right? So like, it still uses the exact same storage subsystem in the kernel. There's really no difference. It's just a fancy process. And I, I remember, I will admit that like, a few years ago, a couple years ago, I had a crisis. Because, because people will ask me these crazy architectural questions, and this drawing didn't exist, and I didn't have it in my head. And I was like, how does that work? And, it, and we all end up in these crises because there's this around storage and network. And this, this exact problem is true across all the things that containers use. So like network, storage, RAM, you know, CPU. Like, like we, we have these crises where we're not quite sure how it works. And then you, you kind of have to go back and be like, wait a minute, let me think through this again. I know how processes work in a Linux system, so I know how this works. I just need to make sure that I think through it properly and explain it to people around me. And then I go to the full bore and show you, oh, like, so this is what, this is what happens on a, so these are two different RHEL 7 systems. One, I, I, this is another one of these ones that I think people forget. These are image layers, and, you know, you pull, basically when you do, oh, you, this actually will hopefully answer your question. <laughs> so I just realized I have this drawing, I forgot. So, so say you pull down, you know, like, like MySQL, right? You're doing an HTTP connection to a registry server. You know, you pull all the image layers down, they get pulled down, they get cached on the host, right? The host then smashes all those layers together using what's called a graph driver. The graph driver either lays them out on, there's, there's two main ways it happens in Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and there's honestly, I'd probably argue two main ways that the universe is doing it. There are a bunch of drivers for graph drivers, but the two big ones are probably Overlay 2 and Device Mapper, and those are the two that Red Hat uses. We're moving to default onto, we, we, our default has historically been Device Mapper, but we're moving to overlay. Um, and so like, basically, long story short, there's a couple different ways in a Unix file, in a Unix or in a Linux system to basically map a bunch of image layers into something that looks like a single directory. Because at the end of the day, that's what you need. You need something that looks like a single directory for run C to be able to go fire up a container. Like, that's basically what's happening. And so that thing that takes all those image layers and maps it onto disk and makes it look like a single directory, that's a graph driver. And so that, that, like, this word graph driver never made sense to me, and I had one of these crises, and I had to go study 
you know, lib st or container storage and understand what was happening. So, you know, pulling the image layers down is one thing. That's a library that needs to know how to do that. And then the next, you know, that's lib uh, store container slash storage, which is a library that like uh, Builda and C Scopio and all these Red Hat tools use. Um, and then and then the graph drivers are what exploded on disk. And then and then what people don't understand is you explode them onto disk as read only layers. And then when you look at an overlay file system and you look through it, it's read only, right? But if you like create a file in that file system, it creates a copy on write layer. And what most people don't understand is, is that these are not this layer is always read only. To disable this copy on write layer, you have to pass Docker the dash dash read only flag. And most people don't do that because things break in random ways when you do that. And so I had a guy yesterday asking me this crazy question. He's like, we're having this problem with metadata not being fast enough inside the container. And I'm like, why? And he goes, he goes I don't know. We're writing a bunch of files. It's like 50,000 files. It uses Yocto or something. And I was like, I was like, and it even took me a second for me to click. And I had to snap back to like what I tell everyone, think through the Unix like basics of this stuff. And, and I'm like, but, but I'm like, you're bind mounting it, right? Like you're writing through. Like as he's like, no, we're writing into the container. I'm like, well, it's using a copy on write layer. So every time you, you know, create metadata, you have to like basically, you're you're making a change as copy on write layer, which is way slower than if you just did a bind mount. So like a bind mount, this basically is the same path that you would use if this is the same code path that you would use if it was a regular process, right? But like in a Docker container, when you use a bind mount, you know, you're essentially creating a mount namespace that then makes it without the dash dash read only option. You're now creating this copy on write layer, and this copy on write layer is slow by default because we we're we're trading off slow writes for convenience and branching. And so now, if you run four versions again, I'm showing three versions of this container. They only have one read-only set and a bunch of copy on writes. And so we're now saving space and making this easier to use, but it's much slower. So does that make sense? Uh, Hold on, we, I I don't know who was first, but I'll go. Okay. That is correct, which leads me to another thing that people always, so, so your question, what your comment slash question is, if you use this bind mount, and then I, I run a container, and then I'm, I think, like, I just push, you know, I create a new version of the container, I push it to a registry server, that data is still stuck on that node, right? Like, it's, it doesn't go with it, which is a good thing and a bad thing. The problem is, is now you need to think through basic DR for that bind mount. Like it's the same thing that you've always had, which is, and I'm actually working on a talk for this, it's basic DR recovery. It's transaction replication, file replication, or block replication. There are three options. That is it. That's how the universe works. It's basic Unix, you know. Again, you know, file replication, block replication, or transactions. And so if it's a MySQL server, it should be able to know how to, you know, copy its transactions over to another server. And so then you shouldn't care. Because if you're running a container here and a container over there and it's doing replication, you don't have to worry about it, the container layer. But if you're doing file file replication, maybe use something like Gluster with geo replication for those bind mounts. Okay, now I can ship that data off asynchronously. Great. Or maybe I'm using SRDF with an EMC system and it already does the block replication. So like you still have to think through that stuff. Hold on, before you he had a question. Yep. Is the top layer the last layer of the image, or is it an empty layer created when you start writing it? Okay, so your question is, and again, it's a weird, and this is exactly why this stuff's so hard, because like it's hard to even ask the questions. You're saying, so is this the last layer of an image? So like if you pull down a container image, is this the last layer? No, the read write one. The read write one, the white one. Yes. Ah, uh, yeah, sorry. The short answer is no, kind of. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, so like it's not the layer. In fact, this is this is an ephemeral layer that gets deleted by default. Yes. So like it's gone if you do nothing. Now with a Docker save command, you can actually export that. It does become a new layer, and then when you push that, if you tag that thing and push it, it will become the next layer. And so you can do that. That's correct. And I think we're getting kicked out. But uh, that's it anyway. So we're good. Thank you.